Well, we finally got a beautiful day to do some flying out here in Pennsylvania. This is one of my favorite spots. It's pretty big and flat. You got a big view of the sky and there's no obstructions like trees or anything. A little bit about myself. I'm an FAA certified drone pilot. However, I fly the 700 just for fun. And I remember being about 12 or 14 years old the first time I saw one and it was at a mall. The, RC, the local RC club had a display going on of a bunch of planes and helicopters. And I just remember thinking how cool they were. Just the mechanics on them, the details of the build. And I knew right then that I was gonna build one one day. It's an Align 700L Dynamator top. I built it in 2016, it took me about three months to design and build. I use the forums like Helifreak and whatnot to help me along the way, very good info on there. I started with a 450 and my very first flight was 12 seconds. I completely destroyed it. Rebuilt it and I knew that one day I wanted to get to a 700 so I just kept at it. Finally got to the point where I wasn't crashing my 450 anymore and I could launch and land it reliably. That's when I decided to step up and build the 700. My main focus areas on this build were safety and reliability, things like abrasion resistance, Placement of individual components to develop a proper CG when the aircraft was complete. Wire routing was also important. I wanted to minimize excessive bends or electrical interference. I took a lot of time and detail into ensuring the aircraft would be as electrically safe as I could. I conducted pre-flight vibration testing before the maiden flight. The avionics unit I have on board allows me to do vibration logging. Depending on the frequency and the amplitude in the log, you can detect if there's a problem in the tail, the motor, or the main rotor assembly and address any issues. Every fastener on the airframe is loctited in place, some red but mostly blue. Prior to the first flight of the day, I conduct a pre-flight check. Things of concern are, uh, is anything loose, wire rubbing, blade tension, gears meshing properly, and then the transmitter range test. Also, after I've packed up and gone home for the day, when I get home, I'll then conduct a post-flight check. I'll look for blade nicks, clean dirt and braces off the aircraft, wipe off oil that's slung out of the bearings, clean the bug guts off it, and just a general inspection of the airframe. With that said, this is something I treat more as a responsibility than a toy. It's, it's a very powerful machine. The motor, I think my motor can peak to 13 horsepower and my batteries currently on board uh, can supply nine horsepower of electrical energy. So that's a lot of power to be flying around above you and it's a joy to fly, but you got to be safe with it. It's not something to be taken lightly. My main packs and receiver packs are electrically isolated. I run Pulse LiPos exclusively. The main packs are 5Ks on KDE direct trays with Scorpion straps and I can get about six minutes out of a flight. The biggest I can fit is 10K packs in it, believe it or not, and I can hover for about 15 minutes with those in. I use 6.5 millimeter bullets on the 6S connections and Dean's connectors on the 2S connections. The EC3s are total junk. I use sacrificial anodes on the 6S connections because with the 60 volt arcing across them, every time I plug them in, it erodes the female bullets away and just blows chunks of hot metal at me every time. So instead of desoldering from the batteries in the ESC, when I have to replace them, I just came up with a solution to make bullet replacement easier. The ESC is a Castle Phoenix Edge HV160 amp, and this is the one that came with the kit. I use a Castle Quick Connect lead to download the flight data from the ESC so I don't have to repeatedly disconnect the servo wires and disturb the output bus from the flight controller. For the avionics power supply, I utilize a redundant system. There's a 2S LiPo and a 2S LIFE feeding a Western Robotics battery buffer. The battery buffer works like a universal power supply. It's solid state and will instantly switch from the 8.2 volts coming out of the LiPo to the 6.6 .6 volts coming out of the LIFE if there's a problem with the LiPo for any reason. LIFE battery chemistry is less volatile than the LiPo, so I chose that as the backup. The battery buffer feeds 8.2 volts to a Western Robotics Hercules Super Mini battery eliminator circuit. I don't use it like a traditional BEC, instead I use it to regulate voltage to the flight controller down to 7.3 volts. I also have a on off switch hooked up to it. The flight controller is a Skookum Robotics SK720 Black Edition with double vibration isolation. I have 3M foam tape and then a stainless steel plate and then gel pad under that to secure the flight controller and minimize any vibration transmitted up to it. There's two satellite receivers 90 degrees out of phase on opposite sides of the airframe. The heli is so big that it can sometimes shadow one of the receivers from the transmitter. 
and how I have them placed, I can always get line of sight to at least one of them. I use 3M foam tape to secure the servo wires from coming loose at the servo output bus. And that way, if I look down and I see the tape there, I know that the servos are all plugged in prop, uh, properly. The GPS2 pad on the boom is an updated antenna Skookum came out with sometime in around 2015. It gets a much stronger satellite signal with the larger antenna pads than the GPS ones did. It's mounted to the boom with a 3D printed plastic base. The boom mount plastic nuts are double locked with a jam nut and zip ties since I couldn't really get them that tight since they're all made of plastic. The GPS2 I have programmed to do some really crude functions like position hold, return home, and rescue now. The return home function actually works pretty well. If I wanted to learn how to do tricks, I could program it with like a hard deck or a soft deck and, the, and utilize the rescue now function, but that's not in the current forecast. All the GPS communication wires running forward to the flight controller across all other wires at 90 degrees, and that's to minimize induced voltages from motor wires or interference from any other wires since the GPS signal is so weak and it's susceptible to magnetic disruption. On the right side is a super bright LED that I can see from the ground uh, to indicate health status of the avionics. Green means it's initializing, blue means it has a good satellite lock, green blue flashing means it's under GPS control, and red means there's a problem or there's too much vibration. I was lucky to get bona fide stock aligned serialized servos. There was an issue with some people are receiving non-serialized servos in the beginning and they were having failures but my kit came with good units. They're capable of running high voltage but I run them at 7.3 volt. The swash is a BL815 hotel and the tail is a BL855 hotel. The tail horn is an axial CNC cut horn I found on Amazon and I had to thread the ball into the arm but uh, it's pretty burly unlike the plastic horns that come with the kit from Align and it just looks a lot better. Motor is a stock Align Dominator 850MX and it's the same one that comes on the 800 class LEs so it's pretty stout. I run the ESC and governor mode at 1800 for takeoff, 2000 for cruise, and 2150 if I'm really banging it around. Governor gain is set at 20. I run the motor timing at three, and the PWM I keep in outrunner mode. First thing I did while building the rotor heads was install grade 10 bolts in the main and tail feathering shafts. It was just a simple upgrade and something that the guys on Heli Freak rec recommended. For the blades, I've been through a few blade sets. I had the Rail 696s on before these, and they did bark a bit more, but they had a 12 millimeter root. The Align 700s, they need a 14 millimeter root, so. I had to run the 696s with washer stacks to make up the difference. I didn't like the way it looked and it really wasn't designed for that, so I eventually found these Rotortech Ultimate Flybarless 700mm carbon fiber blades and I love them. It's got a big 14mm profile at the root and they look sick. The tail blades are Rotortech Ultimate 106s and what can I say, they match the mains. I replaced the white skids with these black ones, put a matte black carbon tail boom on it instead of the black shiny one that comes stock. I typically don't even fly with a canopy on. Without it, it gets better airflow to the ESC and it's so big that you don't need a canopy to see it from the ground. I'll put the canopy on if I'm trying to do a high speed run or something, but otherwise it's naked. On the tail fin, I made this small urethane bumper to protect it and give it a little cushion on landings. I don't recommend the Skookum flight controller. Skookum seems to have gone out of business and can't really be contacted anymore. Art, the guy who used to run it, I think he branched off and tried to do Skookum UAV for a while, but Every time I've tried to contact their customer service line, there's nobody there or you can't reach them, no reply by email or nothing. I'm really happy with the SK-720, they just don't offer support anymore. If I were to build another helicopter and had to pick a flight controller today, it'd probably be the DJI NASA H. DJI has just come so far with their drone technology and the algorithms that they have for smooth flight characteristics of those that they've been able to implement it into the fly bar list controllers for RC helicopters and we kind of benefit off of that. I don't have any plans to build another helicopter but if somebody wanted to make a thousand, I'd probably build one of those. The 800s are, they are bigger than the 700, but the 700 has a higher performance characteristics. So you're not really gaining anything by building a bigger helicopter. I'd love to have a helicopter with some meter long blades, but no one's making an affordable kit. If you like the video, I encourage you to get involved in the sport. It can be very frustrating in the beginning, but if you give it some time and patience and approach it with a safety mindset, it can be very rewarding. Plus you get to spend beautiful days outside like this, so. Until next time, fly safe.